Uh, let's begin with d4, knight of seeds, c4, this is just okay, you said I like to play uh, d4, uh, there is no problem with that, and I played d5 and you said, oh boy, <laughs> meaning you weren't expecting this, right? Maybe you haven't seen this before, this is a Budapest defense, or a, a Budapest gambit, depending on how you play this, uh, you play d5, which is okay, because you're taking some space, probably not the best way to, pr to proceed, the best way to proceed should be d takes c5, but you decided to play d5, which makes sense to a certain extent. Nobody dies because of this move. You said, I want to take some space, right? Uh, that's well, okay. I mean, if, I'm, if I'm not familiar with the gambit, right, then uh, is it better to, you know, just play a solid move than, you know, go into this gambit where you, you know, you don't know the lines? Kind of depends, you know? Depends on your calculation. On how good are you calculating stuff, and... I do believe that not taking the pawn is okay because of what you just said. Like, if you do not feel like you do not, that, like you want to get into this weird um, gambit which might have some tactical resources and weird stuff, and you just decide to decline it and play something more solid, it's okay, right? Uh, it just mm -hmm. gives me the, it just gives me an equal position really quick in during the opening. So after I play bishop c5, I do not have any problem as the black pieces right now. And see how I'm just developing two pieces as you just have made moves of pawns right now, which are not moves of development. You know, uh, something that you usually is like confused is a move of a pawn. People think that's development, but that's not necessarily development, right? It's just a move of a pawn. Yeah, so, yeah, I know. Perfect. So here's the thing, I'm just finishing the development, you said, okay, I'm gonna close, uh, I'm gonna take some space with d5, that's perfectly playable, knight c3, you're starting to develop your pieces, perfect, nobody dies yet, e4, you're taking control of the center, that's okay, bishop g5, this move shouldn't be wrong, but I don't know, maybe just uh, something like h3, knight f3, uh, okay, I, I say h3 to stop me from getting any pins here, which might be kind of annoying, uh, you decided to play bishop d5, which I think is okay, nobody dies, but uh, often in chess you'll say that you want to develop your knights first uh, instead of your bishops. The idea is because um, with a bishop you have many squares to go to, right? And if you just move your bishop here, for example, you're denying the option of your bishop to go here, maybe in some positions to go here, to go here, who knows, right? But if you have just a knight, you do not have that many squares to go to, which are like really useful. So basically there are just two squares to go to, and usually people will go to f3, right? Like, uh, that's like the standard move, and you're not defining the position just out of knight f3, or you, and you're not de denying many squares to your knight as you are with your bishop. That's basically the idea of moving your knights first um, than your bishops. It's not like a golden rule that you cannot violate, but it's just a slight thing that might be better in this position so that you do not define what you want to do yet. Um, might work as well with bishop g5, and nobody dies because of that. I think it's okay. Uh, h6, just getting rid of your bishop, your bishop goes backward. And here you were kind of concerned of uh, of some pins and stuff, and you said, well, I want to keep the pin here and all this stuff. But the problem is that when I start to maneuver here with my knight, this bishop is going to be kind of misplaced, you know? Like, does that make sense? Like, the bishop is going to go to yeah. g3, and what, yeah. what are you doing with this bishop on g3, right? It's kind of not doing too much. So yeah. uh, maybe your bishop will be better in a square like e3 if you get rid of this bishop of c5. Might be one of Yeah, I said, that, I said that later. I wish I could go back to e3, you know. Exactly. And see, because a natural square usually in this kind of position where you have uh, this structure or this pawn structure here, uh, the most natural square for this bishop is e3, usually, you know? So now that you have your, this bishop on h4, uh, even though it looks like decently because it's creating a pin, uh, it is not so solid because in the future I might have these maneuvers and get rid of your bishop here. My, nuts, my knight is really, uh, really well located here, while your um, while your bishop is going to be kind of silly on g3, right? So, uh, yet it is not like a major mistake or anything like that. It's just some uh, positional, um, how to call them? Mm. Uh, yeah, I understand. Yeah, positional nuances, which might be kind yeah. of annoying, right? So knight d7, bishop d3. Uh, probably this bishop d3, maybe bishop e2 better. The idea is that if you move your bishop to d3, it's kind of a pawn, you know? It's like, um, you're saying, well, I want to develop my pieces, but is your bishop really good in this square on d3? It's something to, to ask, right? Because see how it is just interfering with, uh, it's being interfered with these pawns here, you're putting your bishop behind your chain of pawns, and it's basically another pawn more that you have on d3, and it's not doing that much. 
uh, if you move your bishop to e2, at least you have this diagonal to work upon. And when I move my bishop to g4, then um, I do not have a pin on f3, which might be kind of annoying, right? As it happened in the game. So maybe instead of bishop d3, which looks okay, uh, but the problem is that your bishop is kind of getting trapped here. So you want your pieces to go to the place where they have the most mobility, because chess is a game of mobility. So the more mobility you have, the more advantages you can obtain out of a position. But here bishop d3, it's kind of, it seems good because you're moving your, your bishop like out of, of, of this square f1, but at the same time, what are you doing with your bishop there? It's just, it's not just to develop your pieces, but to, de to develop them effectively, right? So maybe knight f3, bishop d2 might be okay. Bishop d3, rook e8, and see how I'm just playing my little plan here, nobody's gonna die yet. Knight f3, knight f8, knight g6. So look at your bishops now, in comparison with this bishop of c5, for example. What looks more active? It is something that you might not have noticed during the game, but um, something important to see is that... <laughs> okay, is, it's like, uh, something important to see is that you can compare your pieces with the pieces of your rival and notice if your pieces are doing okay uh, just out of seeing if your pieces have more mobility than mine, right? So you can see that this bishop on g3, what are you doing with it? It's like, okay, you have just two squares here which are not useful. Uh, this bishop on d3, same thing. Meanwhile, this bishop on c5 has a really nice square here where it's taking advantage of this diagonal. Even though it's not doing a lot right now, uh, it is much better than this bishop. And this bishop here, even though it is not even developed yet, uh, in the future, it certainly will have more squares than yours. So um, see how, do you know the distinction between a good bishop and a bad bishop, right? Yes, yes. So what's your bad bishop in this position? Uh, the white square bishop. Exactly, the white square bishop, right? And what's my bad bishop in theory in this position? The dark square bishop. Exactly, but the dark square bishop is out of the chain of pawns. Outside the pawn chain, yeah. Exactly. So what does that mean? That this bishop is not that bad after all. This bishop is really bad. So uh, see how even if you had your bishop on e2, then you'll still have a little bit more of, of, of ideas here. But as you have your bishop on d3, that's not so nice. Also, some uh, bad sides of having your bishop on d3 is that usually, uh, like in positions which are similar, similar to this one in terms of this uh, pawn structure here on the center, like in King's Indians, you want to play something like what you did with uh, knight a4, uh, so that you can push something like c5 and try to get some counterplay on the queen side. But the problem is that um, one common maneuver of this kind of position is to move your knight to e1, followed by knight e3, so that you can push the pawn to c5, right? And you are not moving your knight out of the center, your knight gets a really nice square on d3, and you can even try to push it with knight a4 in the future and try to bring your rook to c1, and try to generate some counterplay on the queen side, right? Because you said, like, um, as the position is closed here, you, you want to move one of your advanced pawns. That's basically what you said. So how do you do that? Uh, a better way, a more effective way, usually in King's Indians and all this stuff, it's when you have your bishop on e2, knight e1, knight e3, and see how your knight from d3 is threatening to do the same thing that this knight on e4, but without having a knight on a4. Yeah? It's like the plus here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, this bishop on d3, even though it seems natural at the first sight, it is not so natural after you analyze it like in depth. So, um, now that we are um, taking a look at that, and we're getting conscious of these things, now they seem kind of obvious, right? But during the game, uh, these are some little nuances that we are not taking uh, like into consideration, and they might be really dangerous for us in the future. So, a5, uh, the idea here is that I am giving a little square to my bishop if anything happens, uh, I'm taking some control of, uh, of the square b4 if you want to play something like this, which is common in King's Indians with this uh, bone structure here. You maybe have played some games against King's Indians, and you might have seen um, similar positions to this one, but without the bishop on c5, which is a really nice square, but the bishop on g7, which is okay, but it, it's not so good because it's trapped behind the chain of pawns. So, rook e1. Uh, but why are you playing rook e1? That's a good question in this position. Why do you play rook e1? It's just because you're moving your rook to, to e1, but why, right? I, I think I saw a phantom here. I think I was thinking that there were two attackers on e4 
Oh yeah, you said several times that that you thought that you had to overprotect this pawn on e4, and he was wondering what are you prote uh, protecting it from? Because hey, I don't I don't know I don't know what I was seeing there. Yeah, it, it's kind of weird because uh, I just have one attacker, and you have two defenders now, and you decide to play rookie one just in case. Uh, who is gonna attack that pawn? I mean, I cannot do that. I I do not even have moves to go there. Like I cannot play bishop f5 to take yeah, yeah, your pawn or something, this, right? This blindness. I don't know what I was seeing there. Exactly. So I like the fact that you were creating a plan with this knight a uh, a4 followed by rook c1 pushing the pawn and then trying to get some advantage here. I think it's fantastic. But at the same time, see how you're playing just rook e1, which has nothing to do with the position right now. It's just moving your rook like kind of automatically without having an idea behind it. So if you want to play rook e1, that's okay, but you need to have an idea. Um, in this position, even your rook on f1 makes a little bit more well, sense. Well, like, like I said, I was, uh, for some reason I was thinking that e4 was doubly attacked. And yeah. I'm wanting to play rook e1 so I, could, so I had him play knight a4. Yeah, no, but yeah, it was not attacked, right? Yeah, wrong, but that was, that was the reasoning. It wasn't just like, let's move the rook to e1. I mean, I had a... Oh, right, I thought right. I needed to defend the e4, yeah. And now notice even how your rook on f1 might be even better. And the idea is that you can play something like king h1, followed by... Uh, maneuver of like knight d2 or something and then play f4 to try to fight for the center in the future you know which is something common of this kind of pawn structures uh, where the center is blocked you want to get some counterplay you want to get some attack and usually the way to proceed and to do so is to move your knight out of this um, out of the way of the pawn of f2 and then play f4 does that make sense so mm -hmm, if you yeah. have your rook on f1 then that's helping you to do so and that might be even better so uh, notice how you want to keep your rooks in the files which are more likely to get open, right? So if this line is definitely close and there is no way to open it, at least for the moment, because I cannot play f5 because you have too many uh, guys attacking on f5 and all this stuff, and I do not have my bishop on g7, which is like the common way to proceed here when you are playing like a king's Indian and stuff, um, and I cannot just break the center here, that means that this file is going to be closed for a while. Uh, therefore, you want to have your rooks in a position where, um, or in a file where they can get some activity because rooks work in files. The more open the file is, the better it is for the rook. So in this position, if you get to play the f4, then your rook is going to be worth it, uh, it's going to worth a little bit more than only one. Does that make sense? Yeah. So rook e1, knight h5, right? Um, here there might be some tactics, right? I was thinking about this. Probably the best way to proceed, and what I saw, I mean, the computer might say something different, but you were calculating if knight takes e5, I don't think that's going to work, because knight takes e5, knight takes e5, and if you take here, then you're losing your bishop on d3, right? So Yeah, well, that's what I calculated, yeah. Exactly. And if you take uh, here, and I... Um, yeah, that's basically what it is. But I was thinking about a move like knight h4, which might be a little bit more annoying. You know? Because the idea is that you're getting rid of one of these knights which is coming to f4. See how, now one more time, let's, um, let's think about the worth of a piece in comparison with the worth of the pieces of your rival, right? Imagine that um, my knights get here. Is this knight on f4 better than your knight on c3, for example? Yes. For sure, because it has a lot of mobility, right? See how this knight on f4 is really cool. Um, something that Kasparov said once was that the best square for having a knight if you are the black pieces is f4, and the best square for having a knight if you are the white pieces is usually f5. So I am going there. I'm trying to maneuver to get there. See how I have done a, this kind of maneuver, which is kind of typical of uh, Italians and Spanish games and all this, uh, all this stuff. And what I am doing is that I'm trying to get a knight here. So if I get a knight there, you're gonna, uh, I mean, you're not gonna be dying immediately, but the problem is that if my pieces are getting more and more activity and yours are doing nothing, then eventually some tactics might appear. You know, that's the problem of this stuff, of uh, positional game. And that's why uh, if you're playing d4, you have to be really concerned about positional game because um, things are just little by little taking a little bit of advantage and eventually you win, you know? so. Knight h4, uh, knight h5 here, maybe knight h4 was a better way to proceed, uh, so that you can get rid of one of these knights which are going to go to f4, for example. So, uh, I was thinking that if I take here, for example, you can take here, and I don't like this position that much, so I didn't want to do that. I was thinking that if knight h4, so that you get rid of one of the knights, if I play something like knight f5, uh, sorry, knight f4, 
uh, you will take on g6, and then I have to take kind of with my knight, because if I take with my pawn, that's kind of ruined my pawn structure. So, but th see this position, and compare it with this one. Right? Now I have yeah. two knights protecting each other, and this knight here is in a perfect square on f4, and, I, and you cannot get rid of the knight on f4 or the knight of g6 playing something like this, because now we have two defenders of this square, which is this knight and this queen. So, um, when you are down in space, as you are right now in this position, you are a little bit down in space because I have better activity of my pieces, you want to trade some pieces so that the pressure of the position decreases. Does that make sense? Yep. So, see how in this position, we'll wait a second, that not, that's not the position. In this position, it is similar, but there are less pieces on the board meaning there is less pressure on the board and you can play this position even easier than before does that make sense yeah yeah i, I think i just got you know stuck on this um you know i had a plan on the queen side and i saw this possible tactical idea on knight takes e5 and then just the thought i mean i think knight h4 popped into my head but i didn't fully evaluate it for some reason exactly so i don't know why Something that I have noticed, and this is something that happens in life as well, uh, I'm not quite sure what's the term in English, but it translates to something like investment, you know? In psychology, um, people will talk about investment, which is basically when you uh, give a lot to some cause, and then you think that you have to stick with it because you have given a lot, and otherwise the things that you have given uh, will make sense if you do not act accordingly to the cause that you're are working on. So if you invest a lot of time, for example, here, uh, on thinking of this plan, and you th uh, invest a lot of resources on the clock, you invest a lot of movements on, on the board, and all of this stuff, usually it's hard to get detached of this uh, plan that you have. But as the position is changing, and things are uh, working out differently in the position as they were before, you have to be flexible, and you have to try to figure out another way to proceed if the position asks you to do so. So the human idea for that might be that if you see a dog on the street, um, you do not care that much about the dog, you say, well, another dog on the street, I hope I, or I wish I could take all the dogs of the world and make them happy, but sometimes dogs are just uh, having trouble in life and all this stuff, whatever, I cannot take all the dogs to, to my house and, and you just ignore the dog, right? But if you take the dog and you feed him and you uh, take him to your house and you, uh, I don't know, caress him, uh, caress him or whatever, then you feel certain affection for the dog because you have invested in it. So now that you have invested on the dog, it is really hard for you to let it go because uh, if you do so, then the resources that you have invested uh, are going to go down the, the, um, down the toilet or something, right? So um, it has to do a lot with biology and stuff, but that's one of the, uh, of the ideas of this. In chess, sometimes we have to let go of the investment that we have created and we have to try to figure out a way uh, to act more accordingly to the position. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So. Knight h4, a3. And here's a question. Why did you play a3 in this position, right? I was kind of confused here. Um, well, you know, I wanted to play knight a4. Okay. Um, and then I saw bishop b4. Um, I mean, okay, maybe I can just, uh, you know, move the rook. Um... What was that? What was I seeing here? Let me try to remember. Uh, knight a4, bishop b4, move the rook. Yeah, maybe that would have been better. Because uh, the problem is that if I play something like this, or this is just a thing that's coming to my mind, like if I play knight a4 directly, I play this, you can come here, and now a3 is kind of dangerous because uh, when I move my bishop back, you can take it. So, and your rook is coming to the position where it should be. <laughs> so yeah, I think well, yeah, this, we're one. Yeah, yeah. I think this is kind of better for you. A3 is a move that doesn't make that much sense unless you are moving your rook to B1 instead, and then you want to play B4 followed by C5, which is another idea that you might have uh, taken, which is something common of English openings. You know, um, often in English openings you'll play something like instead of moving your rook to C1, which seems to make sense as you want to play uh, C5. Another way to do so is to try to help this c5 move 
with your pawn of c4. So if you get to do so, uh, a pawn is better to, to push this pawn of c4 than a rook because it's worth less. Uh, that means that the bid is, is gonna um, suffer a little bit more to take on c5 if, if, if anything happens. So let's say that uh, a3, for example, in this position makes more sense, uh, then followed by something like rook b1 and then b4, right? Um, let's imagine something like, I don't know, knight f4, rook b1, uh, and a silly move like h5, and then you can play b4, a takes b4, b takes, and when I move my bishop, see how this position seems to be much better for you than before, because you're pushing the pawn with one pawn, which is even better, because you're bringing pawns towards the center, and also uh, you're winning more space. The only problem that you have to be careful with of when it comes to this kind of positions is that the black pieces might play something like a4. So that if you play b4, I can take with my pawn, and then you do not have a pawn here to get rid of my bishop, which is often something that you'll see in King's Indians defenses and stuff, but with a knight which is coming to c5 instead of a bishop. So the problem in this position is that I cannot play a4 because if I do so, I'm losing a pawn, right? So I do believe that this plan might have been a little bit better for you. Uh, instead of just playing a3, uh, in the future, here in this position, it makes more sense because see how you're doing the same idea, but in a more effective way. Perfect, no problem then. Uh, see how in this position, it makes a little bit more sense. I'm giving you some ideas here because as you play d4, these are really common uh, positions that you'll get into and really common ideas that you'll see in many positions. So see how a3 followed by d4 makes a little bit more sense uh, than rook c1. So that's another idea there. So let's go back to the position. You play a3. You were thinking, well, I don't want him to play bishop b4, which is not that big of a problem, but it's okay. So bishop g4. Um, I like the fact that you calculated that if you played h3, there might be some tactics. I don't think I can materialize that because there are kind of too many pieces around your king right now. So I don't think that I can kill you with taking on h3, but I like that you consider it. I was thinking that maybe something like h three bishop here and bishop h2 might be annoying for me uh, because you were threatening something like g4 but I still had something like knight takes h3 kind of dangerous for you. Another way to proceed so that you get rid of this uh, really uncomfortable position because now this pin is really annoying as you do not have a way to get rid of it uh, might have been just play bishop e2 and then you're defending on f3 uh, so that when so that your queen is free to move away and you are not gonna be constantly thinking about this bishop takes f3 or this knight takes c3. So you're getting rid of two problems out of just one move. And at the same time, notice that, and this is something that you didn't say, so uh, this is something that I have to remark here, uh, you have to be extremely concerned of the pawns in front of your king, because these are the pawns which are defending your king. If the pawn structure of your king gets damaged, then that means that in the future there might be some trouble to your position. So let's imagine that, for example, in this position, just, um, I don't know, let's say b3, bishop takes, pawn takes. Uh, you do not want to get into this position because you create many holes in the position. So see how now there are holes on your white squares. That means that if, uh, in the near future, I might play something like this and then try to kill you. At the same time, this pawn on f3 is weak because there is no another pawn defending it. Uh, and at the same time, uh, this bishop on g3, uh, it is not the best piece ever because it is this pawn, which is one of its defenders, is pinned. So what's going to happen is that if I get to move my knight, let's say to h4, and my queen to g5, let's imagine something like I don't know a4 or wait, wait a second, maybe just something like queen here, a4, a knight here, you might be in trouble because I am taking on g3, uh, and when you take with your pawn, I can take with my queen as this pawn is pinned. Does that make sense? Yeah. So. That's really dangerous for you. Also, the natural square for your castle, uh, when you castle uh, on the king's side, is your knight on f3. So if I get to get rid of your knight on f3, and also I generate the abilities in your pawn structure, then that's really good for me. So you do not want the other guy to generate the abilities in your pawn structure. Therefore, your bishop on e2, on, on e2 might make a lot of sense, so that you are stopping me from getting any ideas here, and uh, so that you do not have to take with your pawn. So that's something important. Also, uh, even though this pin is really annoying, I'm not quite sure if you can m just move your queen away because that means that I'm just gonna take and you cannot take with a queen and you, I'm gonna be destructing your pawn structure and that's not really good for you. So 
extremely important be constantly thinking about the safety of your king because this, the king is the objective of the game if your king is dying then you die that's basically what it is and you do not want that right so knight a4 bishop d4 um i think bishop d4 made sense because if i went backwards and you play c5 then my the mobility of my bishop might be kind of restrained or i wouldn't have a lot of to do because this pawn might um be kind of annoying and also the bishop here is just putting an eye on b2 and making things a little bit more annoying right so see how your pieces now instead of coming to defend your kin when where there are a lot of attackers and where there is a lot of danger because my queen can go there and where there is a lot of people and bad guys coming to kill him um you decide to to move your knight to a4 now right you decide to move your knight out of the center and put it in a square like a4 just because you want to keep going with your plan and the problem is that the plan is too slow right so you have to let the plan go and in this position knight a4 i don't like that move it's kind of helping me my bishop gets a little bit more centralized and you're just basically moving a knight away from from the center so one more time let's compare the mobility of the pieces um and let's see what's going to happen this bishop here is better than this bishop on d3 this bishop here is better than this bishop on g3 this knight here is much better than this bishop on a on, on a4 and this knight here is even better than this knight on f3 because there is something which is extremely annoying at the same time uh this um knight of, of f4 is creating a lot of pressure here it has some squares to maybe even generate some sacrifices in the future uh and that's really annoying on the other hand um what's happening with my rooks and your rooks the rook on c1 okay it looks nicely apparently superficially but is it doing something right now is it going towards the place where the action is happening i don't think so so is this rook on e1 doing something especially good not too much either um my rooks on the other hand are as well not doing that much but there are not open files to go with my rooks so after you compare the pieces here and you see that neither your rooks or my rooks or any of the rooks work for anything the only things that are gonna work are pieces or minor pieces are gonna be the guys who are gonna take the control of the game uh it makes sense to compare them and see if the guy who has the control of the mobility in terms of these pieces here um is gonna be the guy who's gonna win at the same time if we take a look at your queen and my queen my queen has some squares to go to and it's free to go in the future if i get to get rid of this knight on f3 for example because uh, i have some space to go and the squares are free for me to go without any attackers on the other hand if you move your queen too far away like let's like say your queen uh move to c1 in, at any given point i can take on d3 uh if you move your queen somewhere out of here then I can take on f3, generating these uh, problems here, and that's what we call in chess an overwork, an overwork piece, which is basically when a piece is doing too much, and you know what's happen, what's gonna happen when your piece is working too much, is that it gets tired, you know? And when it gets tired and things start to crumble apart, then you, you lose, right? So you do not want your pieces to be overworking, you want your pieces to defend and to attack in a decent way. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Did even you play queen h4 here? What? Can you, I mean, you kept showing that queen h4. Does that work? In this position, like queen h4. Yeah, you showed it. Oh, like right now? No, of course. But oh, in yeah. the future, that might be really annoying because if I get rid of this bishop, as uh, happened in the future as well, see how this queen on h4 is taking advantage of your king in the future. We're going to take a look at that uh, just in a couple of moves. So queen d2. I mean, even, even with, okay, never mind, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, what were you saying? I, I was saying even without the bishop, I mean, queen h4, knight takes h4. Oh, sure, but I mean, I bishop can just take d1. here, right? Something like that. Where? Where? Like, I don't want to play queen h4 right now because I'm attacking, uh, even if it yeah, worked, yeah. right? And if I, if I am attacking, I do not want to trade pieces because mm -hmm. number one, I'm decreasing the pressure of the position. Number two, uh, if I trade pieces, what, are, what am I going to attack with, right? It's like uh, if you're going to attack, I don't know, a country or something, and you go with uh, rocks and sticks, and the other guys have weapons, then you kind of die, right? So basically, you want to have weapons to attack the other guy. And if you do not have weapons, then your attack is not that effective. So I do not want to trade pieces right now. I just want to trade pieces when uh, the trading fa uh, favors me, 
right? Like when I trade and it gives me an advantage. So if I had the chance to go to h4 and trade my, my queen for yours, if you take here, for example, or something like that, um, I wouldn't do that because if I do so, then what's going to happen is that I'm not going to have pieces to attack with and then we're going to get into an equal position. So that's not something that I'd like. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that makes sense. So yeah, yeah. So bishop e, bishop e2 there instead of queen d2? Uh, bishop e2 maybe, yeah. But the problem is that um, in life, you solve the problems when before they start, you know? Like in chess, you solve the problems before they start. Yeah, That's I like know. the most it's effective way, right? Point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's like the best way to, to, to prevent a problem. Uh, I mean, the best way to solve a problem is to prevent a problem. Does that make sense? So yeah. now you're facing the consequences of all of this stuff, you know, which seems a little like not too much because apparently you're accomplishing the uh, general principles of the opening. But at the same time, the problem is that even though you're doing so, uh, there is not a logic or a depthness behind it. Therefore, uh, what's going to happen is that it is not so accurate, right? So, mm -hmm. now bishop e2 might be kind of a treatment for this, but it is not necessarily to say that that's the solution. Because the, solu the solution might have been here, right? The solution might have been here, for example, to all your problems, play something like bishop e2. And now you do not have a bishop on d3, and when I play my bishop to g4, uh, I'm not creating that much pressure, right? Also, you have your knight here, followed by knight here, and all this stuff. If you had done that, that's the cure to the problems that you're having right now. Or if you have, mm -hmm. if you have done something better, like let's say rook b1 and a3 and b4, and all this stuff to try to get a more active plan, a more quick plan, a quicker plan, um, that's even better for you. But right now, in this position, you, you know why I play. You know why I probably get in the habit of playing this bishop d3 move is. Um, I mean, you were talking about uh, at some point about how you, you were thinking about playing f5, but you couldn't f5 because um, I had too many attackers on f5, right? All right. And that was, and that was because I had a bishop on d3. Exactly. Right. Right. So if if the bishop was on e2, then your f5 plan works. Okay, but of course uh, you cannot have it all in chess, right? So right. uh, that's one advantage of it, but is this little advantage worth uh, all the pressure in this position? Or even then, if you do not want to have all this pressure in the position, why don't you play just h3 and get rid of this um, bishop here? Maybe your bishop on d3 then makes a little bit more sense without that much trouble, right? Uh, that might be something. Uh, another thing is that it is okay, it's a good reasoning to have your bishop on d3, but that's often, like, I would like to open the position with f5, in in when my rook is on f8, uh, my pawn is on g6, my bishop is on g7, so that my king is protected. And usually when my king is on h7, so that I can push f5, and it is defended not only by um, my bishop on c8, but also by my rook of h8, and my uh, pawn of g6, which are all working together to get a control of the center. If I get to do so, in a position like this one, like let's say with my bishop, with your bishop on e2, and uh, I get to move the same ideas here, uh, it might not be that effective because I do not have the pieces in the characteristical positions where they work. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it is not so effective, but I get what you're saying. Uh, usually this works uh, decently, and this is a decent square against uh, many positions when the queens. Um, in the queen's pawns openings and stuff, but in this position in particular, maybe just bishop e2 or just h3 might be a little bit better. The problem with h3 uh, is that now, see how after I play knight here, that I'm taking your bishop almost for free because um, yeah, this yeah, is a pin, pin yeah. right? So, yeah. not so good now. And now you're gonna start to pay the price of it, right? The price of all these little things that you didn't uh, see at the moment, uh, you weren't so aware at the moment. Now you're gonna to start to pay for that and see how I'm just taking on F3 and trading pieces, which I told you that I didn't want unless it favors me or it's good for me. So once I, do the, uh, once I do that and once I play this position, for example, what's happening is that it favors me for what I just told you about the abilities that I am creating, the double up pawns that you're getting and all this stuff. That Now it's favoring me and I want to do that. So I trade the pieces and now I have a square to go with my queen, bring in even more pieces to attack 
generating this knight h3 checks, taking your queen, and all this stuff, which is really annoying. So that's not so good for your position. Uh, at the same time, now you, when you play queen c2, uh, I don't know what your queen doing on c2, right? You you said, well, I'm just gonna play something with my queen so that um, I do not lose my queen. But maybe queen d1, and this is something that I think you said after doing so, uh, is better because you're defending the pawn on f3 at least, and you have some boofed like uh, bishop f1 in the future if I attack on f3. Like for example, let's imagine that you play queen d1 right now. See how you're defending your ability, which is good for you. Uh, let's say that I play something, I don't know, something silly, like b6 or something. You can play bishop f1, like here, and see how your bishop from f1 is kind of defending the points that your bishop, that your pawn on g2 was defending, but now you have a bishop here and you're defending the position and it makes sense. But with your queen on c2, the problem is that now you have to react to a move which is gonna attack your pawn on f3. So that's not so good, right? Because when I play something like, let's say knight h4, this is attack and you have to do something about it. Uh, if you do not do anything, then you're losing the pawn. If you had your queen on d1, then it will have been defended, so that's a little advantage there. So king h1, now you're giving away a pawn for free. I take it. Rook f1, because yeah, you're losing a quality now, and that's not so good, or and it's change, also it's cool. So knight takes h2. The idea with knight takes h2, uh, I'm not quite sure if that's the best way to proceed in this position, but I felt that it, it, had, to, it had to have something. At this point, so I thought that, uh, of course, you cannot take with your bishop, as you said. That's okay because there is a mate. Um, but if you take with your king, with your king check, you can come to g1. I can go here, and you said that this position won't work. But the problem is that you didn't calculate even um, further away, and you should have calculated bishop takes f4, which might have been like your last hope here. Pawn takes. And the problem yeah, that's, what I, kept, that's what I kept missing. Was, exactly. And I saw it eventually. I saw it eventually. But, in but in this position, you didn't, right? So No, I didn't, I didn't see it until I took on f4. I mean, g4. When I took on g4, and then later I saw I could take on f4. Exactly. So yeah, yeah. maybe in this position, it is losing as well, because after, after this, there is no way to stop f3, followed by queen g2 mate, or you'll have to give away a piece or something. Uh, but in some other position, this bishop takes a four or something like that, or the next move, the move a little bit uh, further away in the position, might be really good for you, because that might be the salvation for your position, right? So, uh, even though in this position that's not gonna work, if you calculate a little bit deeper on the position, that's better, right? Uh, that's gonna go with a little bit of tactics and stuff, and, and eventually you'll get a sense for this stuff, uh, but yes, this is something that you kind of have to see. Otherwise, uh, this might be uh, the last hope that you had and you don't see it. So let's take a look here after pawn takes. And also I'm threatening things like queen g3 check and stuff, which is really annoying, like rook e5 and rook here. So uh, yeah, this position is kind of is kind of done, but you get the idea, right? Yeah. So bishop e2, knight e4. In this position, I might have played just um, knight takes f1, for example and win the position out of material advantages, but I thought that knight g4 had more um, threats. So this is a principle which is called uh, a threat is stronger than the execution. Have you heard that? Uh, yes. Yeah, the main idea being that sometimes in chess, um, you're kind of like, I don't know, in life like a kidnapper, right? Or something like that. And if you execute, or if you kill the person that you kidnapped, uh, does that make sense or do you just want the money and go away without uh, hurting anybody as it might imply that you should like pass more time in jail after uh, you have done a more serious crime like killing a person, right? So do you want to execute or do you want to, th to keep a threat? Is the threat that's stronger than the execution? That's like the human uh, idea for that. But in chess it's basically that sometimes it is better not to execute the most um, simple way to win or not to do the best way to proceed or the apparently best way to proceed uh, after executing, but you can keep creating threats which eventually are gonna pay off even harder like with interests and stuff. So knight d4 and see how uh, in this position things, uh, you were thinking that bishop takes f4, you thought that after queen takes king g2, 
queen h2 check knight f3 uh sorry king f3 the problem with that is that not, here this is a mate yeah, right queen three, yeah. is it yeah but the problem is that you weren't calculating the checks first you know in chess calculate the first cal calculate checks first you know because uh the next move to a check is something forced so in this position i wouldn't have taken on f4 as you said but i will have played queen h4 check the idea is that when you move your king to um g1 for example then i'm gonna take here with my pawn and when you take here i'm gonna take you're gonna move and i'm gonna play f3 you know that's what i calculated at this position mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. then uh, there is no way for you to defend if you play this and uh, there is a mate. And this is what right. I thought was going to happen. But I was thinking, first of all, about the check. Because that's the first thing that you have to think. Uh, not bishop takes a 4, um, queen takes a 4, or pawn takes a 4, but bishop takes a 4, queen h4 check. Once you set, or once you determined that uh, queen h4 is not that dangerous, um, you can go with queen takes a 4. Right? It's like the proper way to, to proceed in calculating stuff is you calculate first checks because those are the most important moves as the answer to a check is just force. Um, then you calculate usually exchanges and finally you calculate some other moves. Uh, depending mm -hmm. on your instinct and what you feel about the position and stuff, uh, those are like the common ways to proceed. But first of all, checks. Does that make sense? Yeah. So bishop takes, knight takes, bishop takes, pawn takes, and this position then there is no way to stop the, the mate which is coming, not only with f3 and queen h2, and queen g2, sorry, but with rook e5 and rook h5, which is a trampoline maneuver, which is really common. And see how, even though the, the rook on, on e8 seemed as a really use, useless piece, right now in this position, is it better than this rook on c1, for example? Or is it better than this rook on f1? Most certainly, because I have some ideas like this, right? So. Mm -hmm. See how the, the file for, the, for my rook open, and now it makes a lot of sense. 